Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. You know me as host of the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, but when I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a book about my experience called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. And now I'm giving away a free marketing strategy session to business owners who qualify. If you can answer yes to any one of these three questions, then this free marketing strategy session will seriously change your business and your cash flow. Here are the three questions. Number one, have you done okay for yourself, but realize you haven't even come close to maximizing your full potential? And is this starting to bother you more and more as time goes on? Number two, Would you like to start charging a lot more for your goods and services and only have to deal with those customers or clients who are willing and excited about paying you what you're really worth? And three, have you ever thought to yourself, gosh, if I could ever figure out how to attract more qualified leads simply by differentiating myself from the competition, I'd be making a small fortune right now. If you answered yes to any one of these questions, then this free marketing strategy session is for you. And don't worry, this isn't some sort of disguised cheesy sales pitch. Look, you'll be amazed how a few simple tweaks can change your business so dramatically. And this improvement, along with the increase in net cash flow that results, is what allows you to retire comfortably, put your kids through college, and take those much-needed vacations whenever you want to get away without having to think about, can we really afford this now? So book your free marketing strategy session with me right now by going to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing. Again, to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar, and today we're going to show some love to the rhythm section. I was listening to, uh, I interviewed Mark Letiri. Uh, from Snarky Puppy and from the Mark Letiri Trio, and I was listening and watching some of his stuff. And he had this drummer on there that was like, holy shit, who is this guy? I want to like meet him. And so we're very fortunate that we got Jason J.T. Thomas with us today. He's uh, tremendous, just a great guy and just a phenomenal drummer, man. He knows how to keep the groove and keep the funk moving. Uh, Just tell you a little bit about JT. He's a three-time Grammy Award winner, grew up in a musical family, started playing when he was three years old, started in church when he was seven, started in party and R&B bands at 17. He worked overseas for a few years in Taipei, Indonesia, and Bali, and we'll talk about that a little bit. He worked with Les McCann, Yarborough and Peoples, Wayman Tisdale, Roy Hargrove's RH Factor, uh, and he's still a member of that. Uh, Fred Hammond, and he won a Grammy. Excuse me, he won a Grammy with uh, Fred Hammond's band for "Free to Worship." Snarky Puppy, they won a Grammy for "Culture Vo- Culture Vulture." I always try not to sound like I'm from New York, <laughs> which I am. Uh, and uh, he won a Grammy with CC Winans for "Let Us Fall in Love." He's also yeah. with Fork, Tommy, and they're going on tour. We'll talk about that later. Tommy Sims, as I said, with Mark Letiri and Mark's trio, and I ep- interviewed Mark in episode number two nineteen. If you want to listen to that. And he's also with Philip Phillips. He played on his Behind the Light and Collateral albums. And he also did the Super Bowl 48 pregame show with Philip. Currently on the road touring with Snarky Puppy, Fork, Mark Letiri, and RH Factor. And JT, thank you so much for your time. Man, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Hey, so you started playing when you were three, man. Yeah, my my folks, man, I, I can't remember that far back, of course. But uh, my folks was like, yeah, right around three... Between like three and four, they were like you. You weren't just banging on stuff. You were literally, if you heard something, you were able to kind of pick up the beat and play along with it and like play time, and started doing. So they just kind of knew like, oh well. My father plays drums, so he was like, yeah, that's pretty pretty much how that's gonna go. <laughs> that's aw- well, man. Listening to you play now, it's not hard to believe you started playing at three because you don't get this good in a week, man. I can tell you. Oh, that thanks, man. Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's, I started playing when I was. I first started playing at church when I was like seven, 
it didn't feel abnormal to me. It just kind of felt like, yeah, this is what I like doing, so I'm going to just do that. <laughs> so you, you, you knew basically from the beginning, it wasn't even a, like, what am I going to do? You're like, I'm a drummer. Yeah, it's it's literally kind of all I remember musically. It's it's always been there. I don't remember a time not being able to play drums. That's fantastic. And I think that's because I did start that young. It's just kind of always been in my head. So I don't really know of anything else prior to being that young to anything else that I would think of doing. It was always music around the house. It was always instruments in the house. That's what I always went to. That's what I always messed around with. That's always what I played with. So sitting up and playing the drums and they asked me to start playing at the church when I was seven. I was like, okay. Yeah, great. <laughs> like, yeah, I, I can do that. <laughs> you know, and I just want to point something. I want to talk about Asia, but I want to point something out. You know, when I introduced you and read through your bio, you've actively now got like five or six different projects going. Yeah. Not to mention, like last week you were doing a gig up in Minneapolis, and yeah, with Donna. Donna Grantis, that, that was a, a guitar player from uh, Prince's Third Eye Girl Band. Hmm. That was. She's got some different stuff going. It's, I think a lot of people would hear her music and would probably be very shocked because if they see her with Third Eye Girl, totally different from that. Totally different. Yeah, but I I think it's real important that people take note of what it takes to maintain and get to your level and, and what it takes to be a hustler in the music business today, man. Yeah. You know, I think that's really important. And uh, people often don't give enough credit to, you know, to musicians, frankly, that, you know, yeah. you got to hustle, man. Man. Yeah. That's a grind. Constantly. I, I interviewed, uh, we talked about Oz before and he said the most demand, he goes, people think, it's a physically demanding job because you got to lug all your stuff around. No, he said it's a physically demanding job because you got to travel. You're on planes. It beats your body up. Yep. You know. Yeah. Planes and planes and automobiles and Uber drives and <laughs> <laughs> barely getting any sleep the day of and barely getting any sleep after because you probably got a four or five a.m. lobby call. So it's yeah, it's, it's just a never ending. It's almost like you're on a hamster wheel. It yeah. Never ends. But but you're having fun and you like it. Yeah, having a ton of fun. I think that's why we <laughs> sometimes we don't realize just how far we're driving ourselves by physically wise. Yeah, it can get kind of dangerous because we don't really think of. You haven't been asleep in three or four days. You might want to <laughs> get some sleep in. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, if you're having so much fun doing it, yeah, it, that it just keeps you going. Well, and the camaraderie you have with three or four other guys doing the same thing with you. Yeah. It's like you're in it together, which makes it nice. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the hangout. It's like a 24-7 hang. So it just everybody keeps each other going. Yeah. Like eventually we'll all kind of crash and we see each other crash and then, then that turns into a thing. Like, yeah, if you don't get some sleep tonight, you're not going to make it to the gig tomorrow. So that starts a whole other thing that keeps you going. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, yeah, it's, it's, it's hilarious. A lot of fun. Hey, you worked over in some unusual places, or not, I shouldn't say unusual, uncommon, Taipei, Indonesia, yeah. and Bali. What's the backstory through that? Like, how did you... Man, I was um, I was doing, like, R&B bands around Dallas when I was, like, fresh out of high school. So, yeah, I was, like, 17, 18. And I guess, like, back in the 90s, there was a big thing with, like, five-star hotels uh like the f&b the food and beverage departments would have these hotels overseas where they had like clubs and like their bar or whatever or they would have a concert room or a club inside the hotel and they were booking bands from pretty much everywhere in the world just booking like r&b and top 40 bands to come over there and you would play anywhere from like a month to two months and then sometimes longer if you kept getting extended. And it was a band called Premier Band. Uh, I think they originally came out of Tuskegee, but then they moved down to Dallas. They were a band that was doing that a lot. And a couple of the guys had come out and saw me play with some band, just some random, just regular R&B band in Dallas. I was doing a regular night. Their drummer wasn't going to be able to go back to, uh, I think the first one I did was Taipei. 
he wasn't going to be able to make it. So they were like, yo, we'd love for you to come and audition for the band and see if there's something you'd be interested in. It's like, we're probably going to be over there for like two months. And it was the same thing like I was doing at home, except there is six nights a week, three sets a night. Holy but, crap. Yeah, but it wasn't too much different than what I was doing in Dallas. Dallas was the same thing. If you were doing a club gig in Dallas, it was three sets a night, three hour sets, two 30 minute breaks. So I was like, yeah, that's the same thing I'm doing here. So I'm like, yeah, I'll go travel. So Got th- over there, went audition for the band here in Dallas, and they loved it. And it was like, yeah, we leave on such and such date. I remember the date was so close. That was the that was the first time I think I had been on a plane internationally. May have been the first time I've been on a plane at all. Wow. During that trip. And I remember we had to drive to Houston like the week before because I had to get my passport. So I was first time getting the passport. And the only way to get it expedited back during those days was you had to go to the actual passport agency in Houston, stay there all day, get it, wait for them to do it, give it back to you. Then you drive back home. So we did that. But, yeah, that was my first plane ride was hopping on a plane and flew straight from DFW to Singapore, which is like 16 hours. <laughs> Holy smokes, man. So, so, yeah, man, we got over there and it was just a basic top 40 gig at these clubs overseas. They were just booking all these bands from, you know, over in the U.S. and bringing them over. And that was kind of a, it was a big thing for like, I think they said they started doing it like in the early 90s. And I came on around 94, I think 95, but mm-hmm. they kept doing it even after I stopped doing it. There were bands still doing it. I think they still do it now, actually. And they just book these bands at these hotels and clubs, and you just play six nights a week. You stay there. It was almost, now that I look back at it, it was almost like a vacation slash um, almost like I got transferred on a job. Yeah. Because I was basically working where I was staying six nights a week. But they take care of all your food. They take care of all your clothes, lodging, of course, you get. So it was, for me, in my 20s, it was like, like this is nuts. And I'm assuming they comp- the gear was compensation horrible. was good, I right? remember that. Oh, the gear conversation was... was... Conversation over there, they spoke English in Taipei, not as much, but not as much as, like, if you go to Tokyo or somewhere where they a lot more English-speaking. But it wasn't too bad. But I do remember the gear was uh, the gear was rough. It was bad, huh? <laughs> I do remember that. Like, okay, how am I going to make this work? <laughs> and I kind of pieced some stuff together. And but yeah, it was originally supposed to be two months, and that first tour I did with them ended up becoming five. Holy smokes! We did five months over there in Taipei. And you were just a kid. Yeah, I was in my twenties. It was it was nuts. It Did was you... crazy. That that same company, I guess, when we went to Taipei, it was the same. It was for the Grand Hyatt. It was for the Grand Hyatt Hotels. They were working with this agency that I think that books all of them. And when we left Taipei, that's when they were like, well, we're going to go back. There's a spot that they had been doing and working in Indonesia and Jakarta. And it was a Grand Hyatt there. And they were like, well, when y'all get done there, we're going to send you back over to Indonesia. And I did two and a half months in Jakarta. Then there's a real famous club there called Jams, uh, Jams Club, uh, J M J J A M Z. I think it may actually still be there. The guy that runs that club and owned it, he's the guy that runs uh, that big jazz festival now in uh, in Jakarta. Um, that's the one that everybody does now when we go over there. I can't think of the name, of it, but I'll think of it. But he he runs the same thing, and I'm, I did that festival over the last couple of years, and when I saw him, it freaked him out because he still remembered my face. But that had probably been almost 10 years before since he'd seen me. Wow. But it was such a trip, he was like, like, yeah, I remember you. You were with Premier. I was like, yeah. <laughs> he was like, you were, he said, uh, you were a little bit uh, smaller then. I didn't, have, <laughs> I didn't have all this stomach I got on me now when I was there. <laughs> a little bit thinner then. <laughs> oh, wow. Were you homesick? Like, you know, you're you're bolting away for two, three months in your early 20s. That's not really because I, when I was doing that, I was just, I guess I was having so much fun in the moment 
mm. didn't really think about home too much. I was like, well, this is home for me now, so I'm doing this. The only thing I wish I had done better then was manage the money I was making. <laughs> yeah, I'm assuming just, they paid you well over there to do that. Yeah, it was pretty cool. For yeah. that for that time frame then, it was it was decent. It was yeah. cool. Yeah. But it was the, the lesson musically that I learned, yeah, that was – Three sets a night, six nights a week. That was that was training. That was because that was and it was three. Their thing for those hotels then was kind of like high energy. They wanted everything high energy. So I was and I was singing too. So oh wow, that was probably some of the best shape I had ever been in, just vocally and physically. But it also kind of prepared me for everything else. Yeah, you know that I've been doing since then. I was like those years were basically my training years yeah. to get me ready for anything else that would come my way. I was pretty much ready for it. It really developed your musical vocabulary, having to play. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. Cause you get to play everything. Yeah. It's like, I know a lot of people tend to bag on wedding bands and I know some of them can be just nightmare experiences. And I've, I've played in some of those bands too. And there's like no way I could imagine being in some of those bands every week like let's, there's no way I couldn't do it um, but luckily a lot of the bands that I've been in have all been really fun and a lot of great musicians in all of them but yeah for me I would attribute the way I play and the way I think musically more so to that than anything else I've ever done Wow, the training that I got from having to learn how to play so many different styles and different genres in one band it's like you go from one night you're going from everything from country to classic rock to jazz to dinner music to funk stuff you're doing disco stuff you do it so it just goes all over the place in three sets That's <laughs> you gotta amazing. learn like six different genres of music and for me i've never been able to kind of just halfway do anything in my brain, if it goes from a P Funk tune and then it goes to a old Rolling Stones tune, I have to switch mentally from the drummer that plays for Funk to Charlie Watts. Interesting. So my brain is like I have to play it exactly how they did. So I've never been able to just kind of just play at stuff. I stylistically in my brain the switch goes off. So it's like however Charlie played it, then that's how I have to play this too. And you know, if you're playing Brown Sugar, I can't just play that with some random beat that I know that'll get everybody through. I can't. I can't do that. I've just never been able to do that. That's really interesting, man. That's it. so that you're like you're talking about giving 110. percent You're talking about that taking that to a new a new level. Absolutely. There, man. Yeah, I, I literally wow. don't know any other way. That's great. I don't know and now that part, I don't know where that came from other than, I guess, a part of everybody's training. I guess when you come up and you play with records and you learn how to play and you're learning songs. And that's kind of the first thing, at least for me. I'm like, however the song went, I learned exactly how that drummer played it. Mm. And you go from there. I just think for whatever reason, the fact that I've always done that, that's kind of stayed on me. Once I got even for church, I was the same way. Whatever song we was playing, whatever church song we were learning, whoever the artist was, I had to learn exactly what the drummer did, and I had to at least do that. Then if I wanted to change something, I would change it from that point instead of I know a lot of people would just kind of listen to the song and play it they want, play it the way they want to. I've always been the opposite. I'm like, I got to learn exactly what he did, then I'll change it. That's great, man. That's like serious commitment. To me, I mean, that's how I take that anyway. Yeah, this it's, it's, it's cost me a lot of hours <laughs> of sleep sometimes. Absolutely. Learning, especially for top 40 gigs because my wife, she, she still teases me to this day. She was like, I don't know why, how you put yourself through that for one night with this band and you haven't worked with them in like four or five months. It's like, I can't, I can't just show up on the gig and like, that's kind of work ethic. Halfway man. myself through these tunes, I'm like, I know how it feels to be on a bandstand when when somebody doesn't pull their weight, yeah, especially with a top forty band. You're playing two or three sets. That's a long night when you feel like you're kind of dragging somebody along, 
or you're having to give them cues all night on every single song. It's like, mm. do your homework. I know it's just a, a small club gig, but I don't know any other way to, to, to do it. I either give everything or I'll say, usually that's, that's and she does respect me for that. She was like, now I know you probably have fun doing those gigs. And the fact that you told them no because you didn't have enough time to learn the material, you have to respect someone that, that will, if I can't give you everything and I know I don't have enough time to learn it, then I'll say no. Yeah, of course you got it. That's like very awesome work ethic, man. Yeah, it's, it's especially it's hard saying no to some of those because they pay kind of good. <laughs> <laughs> but I've literally told them, I'm like, I just I don't have enough time to learn all this material, so I can't I can't do it. Couple of questions: Did you play with somebody over there? Any of those people that you played with, are you, that you still play with once in a while, or that you know that that came up in the business with you that you cross paths with? Uh, I don't play with any of those guys anymore there's a couple of them that i know that i've ran into because one of them is a saxophone player he was actually the co-leader of the band that took me over there and he was the one that actually drove me to houston to get my passport glenn ray mm-hmm. he's still he's still based out of dallas um but he stayed overseas for the longest and he's still over there he's in tokyo mm-hmm. and he he lives there and works there as pretty much most of the year before he comes back to Dallas. Hmm. So anytime we go to Tokyo and we play like the Blue Notes, I always run into Glenn. He'll come and see me when I play that. And I just saw him uh, saw him twice this year uh, in Tokyo. We, we did it twice this year. I did it once with Snarky and then another time with RH Factor. And I got to see him both times. So I still get to see him. There's a guitar player I met, uh, Mark, who was actually from Guam. I think he's originally from Detroit, lived in Guam, came and worked with the band that I was with, and he started with us in Jakarta. (laughs) And then he moved to Oklahoma. He moved to Tulsa. So through the power of social media, he found me, he saw me on Facebook and was like, you still in Dallas? And I was like, yeah. He was like, I'm basically a couple of hours from you. And I was like, like, yeah, I'm in Tulsa. That's (laughs) wild, man. So I know I haven't run into him and played with him, but I know eventually we will. That's cool. So, man. Probably the same thing with Glenn. I think one of these times we've talked about, you know, when I come back to, to-, to Tokyo to try to book something with the band that he plays with and have me come play with him. I said I I would absolutely be into that. That would be that would be hilarious fun for me. Yeah, that'd be a great. <laughs> Especially with him, because Glenn, I'm like, yeah, he he was literally the dude that that took me and drove me to Houston to get my first passport. So it's a lot of memories connected to that guy. That's cool, man. I hope you get to do that. But the rest of them, a lot of the other bands I've seen, uh, I think there's a couple of them that's still over there. Uh, There is a singer from Dallas that came and worked with us right before I got out the band, like for about a year. He still lives here in Dallas, and I actually have worked with him a few (laughs) times in the studio uh, this past year. That's so cool. That's that's been fun because it's always the same thing. It's just story after story after story after story, and then he went back for years and kept doing it with other guys in the band. That's and I get all those stories. Like what are those guys doing now? Yeah, but it's just that's like a whole musical side of me that most people don't even know about because I was over there for years. That's amazing. I, 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 but it was a lot of fun, man. A lot of fun. Uh, there's, I know there's some interesting and like kind of unusual compared, compared to what we're used to here in the States places over in Asia in general. What is like the strangest, some of the stranger stuff you saw, if you can remember? I can't actually recall too much strange other than I can recount. Unusual. Or, Maybe that's a better word. Unusual and scary. <laughs> I remember being in Jakarta and we had to switch for whatever reason, we was playing, I think, at the club in Jakarta. It wasn't at the Grand Hyatt anymore. We had moved to one hotel to play. And I remember the guy coming over the Lao system. And you know over there, and they still practice politics like this to this day. It's probably some of the news now. When they have a problem politically, 
they get to fighting and and shooting and blowing up stuff. <laughs> oh oh yeah, is. yeah. They deal with it for real. It ain't no election and votes and it's it's in the street and people get hurt. <laughs> and I remember them going over the telecom system and sending letters to everybody's uh, room, American wise. They were like, if you have to go out of the hotel today, make sure you go out during this time and in groups. But otherwise. Stay in your room. Wow. And it was because there was some political stuff happening during that time. And some of the rebels and stuff like that, they were in the street. And they were like, yeah, it was blowing up stuff and fighting. And, yeah, it was crazy. That is nuts. So it's like an episode of freaking Homeland or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. I was wow. like, yeah. I remember being in a hotel and, and hearing that announcement. I don't think I've ever, I will never forget it because I've never heard anything like that since. Yeah. <laughs> Wow, but that's probably the weirdest thing. Everything else though over there is not entirely different from being at home. That's probably because <laughs> that's why people get sick of the USA because yeah. we we make them pretty much take everything that we do in the states. We take over there and say, "Here, do this." <laughs> so it wasn't. I mean, musically, clothes wise, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's not entirely too much different from. What you see at home. That's amazing. Barrier. You mentioned, it's funny, you mentioned Charlie Watts earlier. Just in terms of drummers, man, I've always thought he was such a good drummer and never like, you know, he's he not. Got, he got bagged on a lot. And he I'm really like, did. Yeah. It's like, but I'm like, there's nothing wrong with the meat and potatoes drummers. I'm like, you need those guys. Yeah. And it's like, I'm like, okay, I always kind of answer those guys that get into those conversations. I was like, I'm like, okay. Okay, so you don't want Charlie Watts. So I was like, okay, take John Bonham. <laughs> put him with the Rolling Stones. How do you think that would have sounded? Yeah. And then vice versa. Take Charlie Watts and put him with Zeppelin. <laughs> yeah. How do you think that would have turned out? <laughs> totally. I'm yeah, like, man. everybody fits for what they do and for what the Stones were doing and their vibe and the way they wrote, the way Mick Jagger sang, the way those guys played, I said Charlie was the best drummer for that. It's yeah. Like, it, even though he's not the biggest technician and all that in the world, I was like, but they didn't need that. They needed someone literally to play straight eight beats yeah. and that could do that and not do anything else. I was like, and for that music, it worked. I'm like, like I had to just... I had to relearn Brown Sugar recently. I think that's why I put that out there. When I was listening to it again, I was like, man, if you try to play anything else other than what he played on that song, it doesn't fit. It doesn't fit. Yeah, I believe that. Well, it's it funny. Feels weird. <laughs> you said he wasn't the big greatest technician. Neither was Keith Richards. Neither he wasn't. <laughs> For a Same long thing. shot, you know. Try but... to play anything by the Who differently than what Keith did, and it won't work. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, so I'm like, all those drummers are strong at what they did. And that to me, I'm like, yo, if, if that's what you do, that's what you do. Yeah. I'm, I'm cool with that. I, I love and respect them for what they did because I think I learned that the older I got, the more you start to appreciate kind of the, the authenticity and whatever it is that you had to learn. That being said, you – have a real unique style where you're able to like have a bunch of different things going on at once somehow mm. like managing it all and <laughs> and keeping the you know and holding down the the beat the groove and making it all fit in which is when I heard you I was like wow this is you know it's it's a you it's yours man which is really nice wow yeah um, talk about for each one of these guys that you've or projects that you've you've you're involved with. Talk okay. about how you got the gig and maybe a, a cool or interesting story about your experience. Let's talk about Roy Hargrove first. Man, Roy, um, that comes through. Well, one his affiliation from being from Dallas. Uh, he went to school here. He was an art, art, arts magnet kid. Um, and there's a saxophone player that I've played with for years down here. His name is uh, Keith Anderson. And Keith started his, kind of started doing his own band uh, 
I think around 90. I actually knew Keith before then. I met Keith playing in my brother's R&B band. It was like, I think I was like 18. Yeah, 17 or 18. My brother had an R&B band that I would play with. Older brother, younger brother? Yeah, older brother. And there's a junior college where, where I'm from, where we grew up, Weatherford Junior College, that was kind of a a go through. If you went to Arts Magnet, it was kind of a not an automatic thing, but it was kind of the doorway was always open to the arts kids to come to Weatherford Junior College if you couldn't afford a big, you know, mm. to go to North Texas. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of a good in between in the DFW. Like, okay, if you can't go there, go to Weatherford Junior College to junior college but the jazz program at weatherford junior college was always very known in the metroplex okay as being somewhat as strong as the north texas jazz guys and it was because they were getting a lot of the arts kids that couldn't afford to go to north texas they would come to weatherford so, so let me I just remember- t- hang on one second let me just tell people north texas is a very good music school Yes. For people who aren't aware of that, it's like you know, like a Berkeley, a Belmont, that kind of yeah. stuff. Yeah, it's the Texas, Texas Berkeley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. So yes, yeah. So if you couldn't afford to go there, the first word that would jump up would usually be Weather Virginia College, okay, because of the jazz program had become very well known. Even when I was in high school, I knew about them winning competitions and winning awards, and always kind of going head to head with North Texas. So. My brother went to that school as well, and Keith. So my brother knew Keith, and I remember a couple of nights my brother was hoarse and he couldn't sing. So he was like, I'm just going to have Keith come out and have him play all the songs that I can't sing. I was like, Keith? He was like, Keith, that is a saxophone player. And I remember playing at this small R&B club, and that was the first night I met Keith, and that was when I found out. I was like, oh, that's why you called him. <laughs> Literally playing these R&B tunes in an R&B club where they're wanting to dance. But my brother can't sing. But it worked because Keith knew how to, he's just that kind of a player. It worked. And I was like, yeah, I, I could play with him again. Yeah. And I think he knew about me going to Weatherford Junior College because they had tried to get him to go there. And I think he went there for like a year or two. But he knew about me from playing with my brother and just heard about me around town. So when he started to put his band together for his first CD, I think in like 97, he called me, him and Bobby Sparks had already been working together prior to that. And they called me in and we did Keith's first CD, like 97, 98. And then we started playing around town together. I didn't realize that him and Roy had basically grown up together since they were kids. They went to like junior high together. Oh, wow. And then went to Arts Magnet. And I didn't even know because Roy had been gone. He had been gone from Dallas since he was like 17. So I I never even knew Roy prior to that. I knew of him, but my association with him was I knew he went to Arts, but he had been in New York all the time. Okay. So I, I just didn't know that they had knew each other that long. And he was like, man... Roy's been calling me, talking to me about, you know, he wants to do this funk record, kind of a fucking hip hop thing. And he's basically kind of just wanting to use my band. And he was like, I think he's going to come home maybe like towards the end of the holidays during those years. He's like, we're going to just get together, rehearse and let's see what's happening. And over the course of like 99, 2000, 2001, as when we started kind of, he came and basically took Keith's band, and we just played behind him and just added Roy, and we just kind of played through some stuff. He played with us with uh, some of Keith's stuff, just kind of jammed and got a feel for each other, but he knew then, he was like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and do this record. He was like, so right around 2000, we went over to Bobby's house and did the initial, all the initial uh, demos that we did to submit to Verve for the first record, Hargroove, 10 of those songs that we did, we did at Bobby's house in his living room <laughs> for the demos. That's amazing. Back in like 2000. Like Roy came down, his manager came down, and we just sat there and did all those demos. And then the record company sat on it for like a year and a half because they were like, we like it, but they were pissed at him because he didn't want to do it the way they wanted him to. Hargroove 
was supposed to be for Roy. He wanted all his Texas boys to be on the record. Right. The record company wanted Questlove, George Duke, Christian McBride, and all those kind of guys involved because they just thinking Roy don't know what he's doing. He's just a jazz guy. Right. But he was like, no, nah, I know what I'm doing. I'm from Waco, Texas. <laughs> it's like, I grew up in Waco, grew up in Dallas. I grew up listening to R&B and church music and blues. I learned how to play jazz. Right. Like, but all that other stuff has been in me since I was born. So that's how I ended up meeting Roy was through Keith. He basically, the R.H. Factor band essentially at first was Keith Anderson's band. Oh, and he, then, just, he basically okay. just used us. And then we took me, a uh, guitar player from here named Todd Parsno, uh, Bobby, we all stayed with him, and Keith, we all stayed with him when it kind of meshed some of the New York guys and us. We stayed with the Texas group. But okay. initially started out, it was just Keith's band and Roy. <laughs> Let me ask you this. I'm almost positive. Reggie... Um, Reggie Washington plays with Roy now, correct? Yeah. Okay. He I'm, started. Yeah. Um, he came back. Um, Reggie was the original bass player with the R.H. Factor. That's what I thought. And, and then around 05, he left, and we brought in a guy that uh, that Roy was was really good friends with from uh, from Boston, uh, Lenny Stallworth. Okay. Lenny stayed with us. All the way up until this year, actually. That's when Reggie came back. Lenny literally just passed away this December. Oh, man. We I'm sorry. Played, uh, last year, September, we played, we were getting ready to go do Tokyo Blue Note. And we literally found out like a couple of weeks prior to that, his uh, Larry uh, Clothier, Roy's manager, called everybody on an emergency call and was like, Lenny just called me and said he just went to the hospital for, said he was having some difficulties in his chest and they ran a bunch of tests on him when they found out. They were like, he has stage four cancer. Oh my gosh, it's terrible man, so sorry. So they were like, they were at this point, well no, we find out it was stage four later on. When he initially told us, they were like, they saw some tumors and they were cancerous, but they thought they would be able to get him out. But they were like, they're like, they're finna rush him to surgery right now. Wow. <laughs> On that day that he called, so that's when we were like, okay, well, it's either get Reggie back in the fold, or we have to deal with some some guys in Japan. I think we were gonna reach out to that were there already. I was like, but we don't need to go that route. Reggie still probably knows sixty to seventy percent of our repertoire because he played it. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, so find out where he is and if he's available for these dates, and hopefully he's available. And thankfully he was. So yeah. he he just started back playing with us this year, right after that, because for once we kind of found out just how bad it was for Lenny. That's when we found out. It's like, yeah, it was a lot worse than what he told us initially. Man, I'm sorry about that. Well, that's, that I, brought Reggie back into the fold. Because Reggie, I interviewed Reggie a little bit back, and I know him, knew him through friend, mutual friends in New York City. His his interview comes out in a couple of weeks. Super cool guy. Oh, sweet. Yeah. yeah really good guy. He's in Brussels yeah, now. I was, I was always a big fan of his because of all the the stuff with Steve Coleman. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, he's a good guy. Been around the block for sure. Yeah. Man. Talk about Snarky Puppy. How'd you get hooked up with those guys? The Snarky thing started with the affiliation of uh, there's a guy that was here, a trumpet player, keyboard player named Phil Lasseter. Phil, um, big thing, Phil, Phil and Keith both were in Prince's Horn section right up until he passed. Uh, Philip was his main arranger over the last couple of years. But Philip, when he was here in Dallas, same thing through Keith. He knew him and Keith had worked together at a couple of churches. And I think one of the Saturday services or something came up and he needed a drummer. And he was like, you know, call that guy that plays with you. And he was talking about me. So he called me up. I worked with him at this church. And that started that relationship from that point. Anything that he did that he could call me in on, he called me in on. And it happened to be this other church he started playing at some years later. And he ended up calling me another game for like a Saturday service. He was like, 
I got to get you out here because you got to hear this young dude that I just met from North Texas that I got playing bass out here. He's like, you got to hear this dude play. Two y'all need to meet. Y'all need to play together. So come do the Saturday service. And we did that. And when I got there, it was Mike. Yeah. I didn't know who he was. and I didn't know anything about the band other than the what Philip had told me. And he hadn't told me about the band since then. Met Mike. We did that service. Great player. I remember it was so funny. He, he, he hates being told about this now. Mike was playing a four-string Ken Smith bass back then. It that? was so funny because gospel music back in like the 90s and 2000s, you kind of, <laughs> if you were a, a bass player in gospel music, if you weren't playing a Ken Smith, you probably got talked about pretty bad. Oh, really? But it was usually a five-string Ken Smith. I don't even think I ever seen a four-string Ken Smith, let alone somebody using it in jazz. <laughs> uh, okay. And it's so funny because he hates that bass now. Because <laughs> he ended up going back to a Fender. But yeah, when I first met him, he was the same thing you see now. Just a skinny dude, curly hair. Just all this groove and soulful stuff comes out of him. It's just natural. Yeah. When we first played, it was like I had been playing with this dude for years. It was just easy. A lot of the, and just because, I mean, now we know. All of us was listening to the same stuff, so we were all pulling from the same vocabulary. Mm. All the same stuff that I loved listening to musically, he was listening to the same stuff. And even more so because part of what him starting Snarky Puppy, a big influence on him was R.H. Factor. So he already knew who... So he knew you. He yeah. knew me, he knew Bobby, he knew Keith, knew Todd, he knew all of us already anyway. But it was always kind of this weird separation from Dallas guys and Denton guys. It was like all the people in Denton was just students. They didn't pretty much go anywhere. They just stayed in Denton. That's what they did. People in Dallas stayed in Dallas, played in Dallas. That was that. It wasn't a lot of going back and forth until Philip introduced me to Keith. I mean, to to Mike. Mike already knew about Keith's band with me and Bobby and Todd. That's when we found out about Snarky Puppy because Mike was like, well, we play, you know, our CD's going to be coming out soon, and we're going to be doing some gigs. There was a club in Denton called Haley's that they would play at all the time. He was like, man, I would love for, you know, Keith and Bobby, for you guys to, you know, open up the show for us. So we started doing some shows with them in Denton, back and forth. And that's when I had first met the whole Snarky Puppy clan, the original Snarky Puppy guys back then. This was like 2007, 2010. Yeah, about 2006, 2007. Hmm. The first regular just came out, and they were just primarily at that time just kind of playing around hmm. the Denton area in a couple of clubs. And I remember then when I saw the band, I remember we played our set. I was just going to pack my stuff up. I'm like, I want to check out a couple of songs, and I'm going to go back home. Hmm. Like I, I normally don't hang out long unless something keeps me there. Next thing I know, I'm still standing back there 50 minutes later with my mouth open like, yo, who who are these kids? Where'd this band come from? And how come I've never heard of them? <laughs> it was just, even from the music they were doing then was a lot more, he would kill me if I said this word, a little bit more fusion. Yeah. <laughs> but it was just, I would say it's a little bit more compositionally aggressive than the stuff they do now stuff then was really you know kind of arithmetic there was still a lot of groove stuff and great melodies and stuff that's always been in him um but a lot of you know time signature stuff and odd meter stuff he's always loved doing that um and you were attracted to that you were attracted to that i wasn't attracted to the odd meter and i still don't like playing odd meter <laughs> this is i've just never had fun doing it but I was attracted to the fact of the band was ridiculously tight. Yeah. And the tunes, the songs never... He likes writing songs like stories. The melodies all go somewhere. It's not like, okay, here's a melody, here's a section, here's a section, and we just put this all together and call it a song. Everything links together musically some kind of way. So it's not like chorus, verse, chorus, verse. Yeah. Yeah. That's... All his stuff kind of made sense and it would tell a story. It would make you want to keep listening. Mm. 
And that's what I kept doing. Like, song to song, I'm like, okay, well, they did that. Let me see what they're going to do on this next song. I'm curious to what it's going to sound like. And that has just kind of always been the thing is you never know what's going to come out of his head because even he'll go and write six songs and they'll probably sound six completely different ways. There's some similarities in his writing that he always does. And I think that's just his signature. But it may be six different kinds of beats. Like it may be a West African thing on one song. It may be a straight hip hop thing on the next song. It may be a slow Motown thing on the next song. And he'll do that because that's everything that's going on in his head. But I think that was a big draw to me because I like switching up stuff so much. Mm. So I was like, oh, he's got this kind of thing on this song, and then this song they did that, and then on this song they did that. And I was like, yeah, that for me, it was it was fun to listen to. So I became a fan of the band then. I didn't even realize at that point how much of the writing he was doing at that mm. point. I didn't really know that side of him until years later. Just But just as a player, it was it was an automatic kinship. It was like I've been playing with him for years. Yeah. And then meeting all of them, meeting all those guys, it was an automatic friendship too. They were all very down to earth, very humble and very hungry. Those guys wanted to play and they were going to play, period. No matter what they had to do, that band was going to play one way or the other. And you didn't let the, uh, you know, the turf thing, you know, the Denton versus DFW oh, no. cloud, cloud your vision, which was cool. Mm-hmm. Not at all, because at that point, they had started, you know, Mike had started playing at some churches in town with Philip Lassiter. That also introduced him to some other, uh, it was two big gospel camps here that came out of Dallas, uh, Kurt Franklin's camp, and then there was some uh, youth choir came out of it called um, God's Property. Hmm. God's Property is basically split. Okay. But Robert C. Wright, the original drummer, well, not the original drummer with Snarky, but the one that kind of took over from 06 and 07 when they started really kind of going everywhere. He and his mom and his family, they started that group, God's Property. And it was kind of uh, basically a youth version of Kirk Franklin. Okay. That whole big body would, and Bobby Sparks was a part of that crew. And we all knew Philip Laster because he was using us. And then he started pulling in Mike. That's where Mike met Sean Martin. That's where he met Bobby. That's where he met Sput. They started calling Mike to play with them. Okay. That started the whole emergence of the Dallas guys. That because they they found out about the band the same way I did. They like randomly went out to dinner and saw the band. Everybody kind of had the same look on their face, like, "Yo, <laughs> who are these guys? Where do these guys come from? How, <laughs> why are we not I'm just just hearing about y'all? Y'all been in Denton for like three years, and we was like, we've who knew? Mm. Like, okay, yo, this whole separation with Denton is just got to, we got to fix this because this is yeah. ridiculous. Like, these jokers have been in school all this time and we're just not meeting y'all. Like, this is ridiculous. Like, we should have been met and we should have been playing years. <laughs> That's great, man. Because he had the same reaction to them. Like, when Sput pulled him in and had him start playing with the gospel stuff, he knew exactly what to do, exactly what to play, and he fit in perfectly. It's so cool, too, how um, Philip brought you into this thing, and then two years later, yeah, I, that's what I like the most, but the stories I like, because, you know, I always say you can't connect the dots moving yeah. forward. You know, you never know, like, like oh, man, these the, doors the, open. They're so cool. The tree branches yes. that connect from, from DFW and from, from Philip Lassiter and from all the gospel stuff it's it's one big huge tree yeah, yeah but that's, <laughs> but that's one cool big, one big massive musical family tree all of us connect in some kind of way through somebody we know or somebody we've played with hmm. or it's yeah it's, it's endless it's even through uh like the neo the whole neo soul thing that started all the people involved in that with like Erica Badu and all her bands is all her band members are either people out of people that either work with Snarky Puppy now, but either came out of God's property and the gospel stuff or people from the R.H. Factor that we've worked with it all. We're all connected in some kind of way, which is really and cool. Texas, it's, 
big, big family musical tree. But yeah, my my affiliation with them started with Philip with Lasseter. And then at a random crazy church service at this church that we still laugh and talk about now because it's probably one of the craziest churches we've ever been <laughs> have ever been a part of. <laughs> we were playing stuff in there that even we couldn't believe we were playing like are we actually going to play this at church? Are you serious? You've lost your mind. Or better yet, this church is crazy. <laughs> like what? Like us... what kind of stuff? Oh, man. That band at that church was me. Mike Lee was on bass. Bernard Wright was playing keys. And we literally kind of just left the church for a minute and just went straight. <laughs> I mean, straight funk. Like hardcore, like P-Funk. Had no, I mean, we weren't trying to be like Kirk has done that with some of the gospel songs with Kirk Franklin, where he's kind of merged some old school funk and some gospel stuff, but it's still, you could tell it was still supposed to be a church song. Hmm. When we played, it was like we went to a club. <laughs> <laughs> Completely left the church away from what we were doing. We were like, it's just us right now. Let's just do what we're trying to do. And it went hardcore music funk. For like ten minutes, but the pastor there that was a pastor of the church, he was he was a little 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 touched, a little crazy. So he was just like, Yeah, yeah, let it go. It was like for us, he was like, Okay. <laughs> hey man. And we let loose, man. That's I told me and Mike still laugh about that to this day, like, yeah, that was that was wild. <laughs> it's like that pastor was crazy to let us I mean, we was like we was at a club at a full on concert. Great. <laughs> so it was, yeah, at that point we was like, okay, we're gonna let us do it. We're gonna do it. Absolutely. But it was great for me because I was like, yeah, musically we got to know each other real well that day. <laughs> How did this thing come about with Super Bowl forty eight? That must have been awesome. Oh man, with Philip Phillips. Just my my whole involvement with him is is wild too. That that came through Bobby. Bobby was playing keys for Philip for like a year after Philip won. The year after Philip won American Idol, that year he went out on the road with uh, John Mayer when John Mayer was doing his, was that the Born, yeah, Born and Raised tour. And he went out and switched keyboard players, I think, kind of midway through the tour. The MD for that, for Philip then, was a guitar player from L.A. named, he'd be good to reach out to, too, if you've never talked to him, a uh, guitar player named Errol Cooney. Errol Cooney. Monster. Uh, just spent the last couple of years touring with, he was a part of the Stevie Wonder uh, Songs in the Key of Life tour, but he was also a part of Janet's band. Oh, so he band. goes way back. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he way, way back. Uh, but him and Bobby uh, met each other from playing with Leda Hathaway for years now. But when they switched keyboard players, Errol reached out to Bobby. Bobby came on and after about a year, they were switching drummers. The original drummer with Philip was Gordon Campbell, but Gordon was also doing the American Idol tour that they would do. So he had a sub, but the sub was leaving, uh, like, kind of middle of the tour that was left. They had, like, one year left, like six months. They just needed somebody literally for a couple of weeks until Gordon came back. And Bobby told him to... Uh, reach out to me because Earl had asked him like what about the cat that plays with you and, and Keith and R.H. Factor he's like he's at home he's like yeah we'll reach out to JT and call and see if he can do it he said uh, Philip got like a list of names from everybody in the band of course gave him drum rim. like so he went up said he YouTube everybody looked at me liked what he saw came back downstairs and told Bobby like yeah I want JT call him that's all isn't that Literally, wild? The YouTube everybody. How wild is that? Just that's crazy. I didn't. I didn't even realize that's how Donna uh, was discovered. Prince saw her on YouTube. That's amazing, man. I'm sure that's how I a lot of people are discovered. Yeah, it was like because she was in. I didn't realize this until I wouldn't play with her. She's from Toronto, so when I went to do this gig with her, one of the people she called before me was Larnell, because she was like, "Yeah, I've known Larnell for years." <laughs> It's like he's we've played together a lot. He's like, I'm from Toronto. I was like, I had no idea. That's Freaking wild. Small man. world. <laughs> but yeah, he was like, Amazing. Yeah, he, he he went and looked up. I think he had like a list of I think he said like four or five different drummers. 
and went and YouTubed everybody. And he just like it. And was like, he just liked what he saw with me and came back downstairs and told Bobby to contact me. Hey, that's the value of if anybody's listening as a musician, that right that's the value why you need to put stuff out on YouTube. Yeah, that's the good part of YouTube. It's a bu- <laughs> it's a business card. It's a yeah. virtual business card. Yeah. Effectively. So I did that. Awesome. That tour was uh 2013 and initially it was just supposed to be those two weeks. I was initially just just coming in as a sub until Gordon came back. So after that Gordon has always been busy touring with a, a list of whoever. So 2014 came. Philip was about to do his new record, Behind the Light record. That was also the year of the Super Bowl that we did. He was like, I'm going to bring you back to do the record, but would you possibly have any interest of you know, staying on and possibly doing the gig? Gordon may be coming in and out a lot. And I would much rather just have somebody here yeah, rather than keep dealing with the subs because this last situation got a little hairy. <laughs> yeah. So it was like, yeah, I would, I would definitely love to do it. And that was the first show we recorded the record in January. And then at the end of January during the Super Bowl, that's when we did the, the pregame show thing. And that was nerve wracking. That was the first time I had seen somebody actually kind of buck the tradition even for the live show, I think everybody probably knows by now, the only person that never done live was Prince. Everybody yeah. else, they they pretty much push on you. You have to pre-record it and play along with it because they don't want any, they don't want to have to deal with real Janet, time. Issues. Janet Jackson. <laughs> they don't, that, and then that kind of stuff. Yeah, they don't yeah. want to deal with, you know, sonically, musically, recording wise. They want everything to sound perfect like the freaking record. And they want to be able to market it like that Hmm. and not have any issues. So even for the pregame stuff, for the tailgate stuff we were doing, they wanted the same thing. They were like, we're going to broadcast just one song from your set. But, you know, we want you to do that song with the tracks. Philip has never liked playing with tracks. Hmm. And that was kind of odd to me, too. I'm like, yeah, this is one, a pop artist that don't like tracks. Yeah. (laughs) I'm like, how odd. But... He likes to play and he actually comes more from a player's point of view rather than singing, Mm. even though they push the whole singing thing on the show. He loves to play like playing with that band with Phillips band was almost like being in a jam band more than it was a pop band. That's unusual. Because We would do all these long extended solos and long extended jams at the end of songs that would be almost as long as the song didn't have anything to do with songs, just straight instrumental riffs. (laughs) Which is great. At these pop shows, which is hilarious looking at his audience because we knew they have no clue of what we're doing. <laughs> this is totally self-gratifying for us. <laughs> hey. But, yeah, when we we did that show, that yeah, that may have been my first. That was my first gig with him, technically. And I remember it was nerve-wracking because they kept being on him all day about performing with the tracks. And he didn't want to do it. And we had already, you know, been practicing and rehearsing it without it. And he kind of likes the natural tug and pull if he wants to pull it faster, if he wants to, you know, drag it slower. He likes having that freedom. We kept rehearsing with the tracks and he kept looking back at me like, I don't know about this, man. I'm like, yo, it's on it's on you, whatever you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I remember he literally pulled the plug like as they were counting him down great in his in his ear they were like counting him down like we're going live and blah 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 five four he turned around and looked at me and he was like <laughs> so no tracks no tracks i great, literally man. had my stick my stick was down sitting on the space bar of the computer like i was ready to go and he was just like nope like literally like five four three click Two, one, and he just started playing. That's great. We man. was laughing our butt off, and, and we was like, wow, he just pulled a, a big muscle move, like, I'm not doing it. Because the producer of the song was there, management was there, people from the label was there, and he basically just kind of like gave them the finger at the last minute. And how did it get How did it get pulled off? It sounded great, I bet. It sounded great. It yeah. didn't, of, of course, you know, you know, vocally, it, it didn't sound perfectly like the record. It mm. didn't have all the harmonies and all the vocal stuff that's on the rack on the record, and 
didn't have all the strings and everything and the horns. It, it didn't have all that, but mm. it was raw. Yeah. And I think everybody had, at that point, that was there respected the fact of it still sounded good. Yeah. It wasn't perfect, but nobody knew that except for the people working for the NFL and, you know, that listened to the CD all day long. That's all they wanted to hear was the CD, basically. Yeah, that's. But it came out yeah. fun. But I remember, I was like, yeah, this is nerve wracking because I know that everybody's about to be watching. And I'm literally sitting here going, what are you going to do? <laughs> are we using this thing or are we not? <laughs> Are you normally like you personally? I'm sorry. Uh, are you normally JT like a rule breaker or a rule follower by nature? Uh, probably more of a. I would say musically, probably a follower. So more than I am the breaker because a lot of the music, uh, especially even kind of like with Philip. It was the same thing. It's like, I know I'm coming into a situation to where, you know, for the record, that first record he put out, most of that record was Sean Pelton. Uh, guy that plays with Chokro and uh, Saturday Night Live is probably where most people know him from. Mm. Um, but I know the way he plays. And then when I listened to the record, when I, when I first did my first shows with Philip, you know, six months prior to that, just in the middle of the tour, that was my same thing then. It was like, I know it's me playing, but I have to at least give them what they're used to. Okay, so you're normally being called in to sort of replicate something or play close to it. Yeah. So you don't usually have the, the leeway or the discretion to be a a, 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 a rule breaker. It's your job yeah. is, yeah, okay, I understand that totally. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I totally get the that. The only situations, that's, I, never, I never thought about it like that way too. Uh, yeah, when you said that. A lot of what I've done through my career has usually been called in. Yes. A lot of the stuff that I've done, even the work that I did around um, Dallas, a lot of the R&B bands I played with then, I was playing on top of tracks that had drums programmed in already. Yeah. Uh, when I started doing a lot of more top 40 bands and wedding bands, I actually started doing those because I was subbing for uh, drummer Keith uh, Keith Carlock. Right, I know him. Studio Dad and Sting yeah, and yeah. everybody he's played with. When he was in Dallas, I became his basic, basically, everybody he played with, I would sub for behind him. Because once I subbed for him, he kind of figured out, he was like, well, yeah, I can use you for everything. <laughs> <laughs> so whoever he was playing with, he would just say, if, if he couldn't make it, call JT. Okay. And that's how I started. But it was the same thing. However, Keith played the gig. When I first came in, that's how I played it. It was like that's you were basically getting Keith through me. <laughs> so I'm assuming now that you have your own projects, it's got to yes. be like so liberating for you to go in there and like not have to deal with that. Not that you know, I'm just like yeah. it's not an issue now. It, it, it's just you. Yeah, that's been that was the funnest thing about the RH factor was the fact of we created and played all that music from the ground up, literally. That was always our thing. We started that from the bottom. Everything musically that's been done with that band, we were a part of. Mm. You know, I mean, outside of, on that record, on the first record with the RH, with, with the Hard Groove, I'm actually on like 75% of the record. There's a couple of other drummers on that record. A lot of people may not even realize they probably think the whole record is me. I wish it was all me, but it's not. The last record for R.H. Factor was mainly me because it was always two drummers in that band. So we used two drummers on the last record. We used two drummers a lot, playing both at the same time. But on Hard Groove, most of it's me and there's a couple of other guys on that. But grooves-wise, if Roy didn't come up with the beat, he kind of let me just you know play what you hear. And on some of that stuff, it's still fun to go back like, oh, yeah, that's actually came out of my brain. I just felt it, and that's what came out. Which so is like probably... To see other people's reaction to that is, is kind of cool. And then to actually when you see other people play songs from that and they're playing something that you know you kind of did first, it was it's kind of neat. 
Isn't it rewarding? Same thing with Fork. Fork was the same way. It was other than the guys kind of coming with whatever rhythm or beat they wanted to have, which a lot of times they would. Um, it was still kind of my embellishment of it. They would still basically like JT, you. This is what I have programmed, but whatever you hear in your head or however you want to play it, do it that way. Where did you, how did you develop? Uh, this is I hate this question because it sounds like a vanilla question. <laughs> it's like how did you develop your style? I hate to ask it, but you do some oh, no, unique. No, no, no. You do unique. What you do is unique as a player, and like oh, thanks. Where did that? I don't mean like who influenced you, but like what was it's very deliberate. It's not something that like you wake yeah. up one day and say, hell, let me do this shit. You know, I think, um, for me, I don't know if it's because of the fact of my family, my mom plays piano and sings. My father plays drums and sings. My brother plays drums, keyboards, and guitar and sings. And then for whatever reason, for me learning songs, I was always able to learn songs a lot easier um, especially when I was us uh, in church growing up when I was, yeah, real, real young, it was always helpful for me to actually kind of learn the whole song. I kind of, even though drums was what I played, I was almost, that was the thing that I paid attention to almost last. I was always more interested in what the bass player was doing, what the keys was doing, what the singers were singing, if there was guitar parts. and st- That kind of stuff almost fascinated me more than the drum part. The drum part to me always kind of felt like, okay, well, what he's playing, that's what he's supposed to be playing. But all this other stuff, that's kind of cool. Let me learn all that. So I just always had a habit of learning everything that was going on in the song. For me, that made it easier for me to play because I wasn't you know, just so focused on the drum beat I always kind of felt naked if that's all I knew was just mm. the drum part. Yeah. It's like for me, it always made more sense. Well, if I know what the bass is going to do, then I can play this. Or if I want to play something different, I know it'll fit because I already know the bass line and kind of went, you know, for every instrument to affect what I play or why I would play. I would play is because I knew what they were doing. Okay. So you kind of so approach. Every- Sorry. Yeah, approach wise, it kind of comes from not just the drum world. It kind of yeah. comes from melody. It comes from rhythm. It comes from sonically, whatever space they're occupying. I know I can put this there because I know they're going to be in this section. And yeah, it, it kind of all influences me from from all directions, not just not just drums. Yeah, it's almost like you're an art, like an artist, and. Each one of, you know, the, the bass is a color that you use and the guitar is a color and the melody is. And then you're yeah. like, okay, how can I take these <clears throat> colors and blend them together as opposed to how can I hold down the beat? And Yeah. And you're not looking to be the bottom. You're looking to be the the guy that wraps it all up in a sense. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, man. I've always liked the the whole totality of how everything sounds together more so than just I'm just gonna do my thing and I'm like yeah but okay if you start trying to switch stuff up or not play what's there originally then you're gonna mess up everybody else well, the, the, and, and it's just gonna sound a mess and I'm like I don't want to be that dude <laughs> well you're not that guy man because you when you're playing you're enriching I mean you could tell like I said this is deliberate this isn't like Wow, what made him do that there? It's like you're thinking like Yeah. You know, like how do I enhance how do I bring this whole thing up? Not like you know, yeah. how do I sound cool on the drums? Yeah, it's like I'm I'm it's the same way when I play. It's I, I get just as much gratification out of playing my part and the drums, but I also get just as much fulfillment and fun out of what everybody else is doing. I love listening to bass lines that bass players come up with i love guitar stuff what guitar players come up with and so on and so forth it's all the stuff that they do influences me so much i'm just as much into what they're doing as into what i'm playing well, man, it's you, like all that you, kind you of stuff is, just affects me so much because i think it's because i probably wish i played bass and guitar and all this so i hear them come up with stuff i'm like that's that's freaking awesome <laughs> what happened with that 
that'll be even more awesome. <laughs> well, well, it shows, man. And when you're coming up, when you're playing, it's you're just tying the whole thing together, man. I was just man, really thanks so much. Appreciate it. Um, what was some tuition that you might have had to pay in your career, as far as like? You know, everybody in their businesses makes mistakes at some point in time. Have there been any mistakes you made? Um, I don't necessarily mean playing mistakes, but things that like lessons, tuition you learned that, ah, oh, they're not going to do that again. What, what are you, maybe one or two of those if you could share? Yeah. Um, yeah. It'd probably be not being prepared. Right. Yeah. It was, I have, Probably the two worst feelings I've ever felt was knowing that I didn't do the homework and then getting there and, and folding and just, I got through the gig, but it just, it wasn't my best. And, you know, it kind of affected everybody else on stage. And I could tell that they were like, yeah, this, this cat didn't listen to stuff. He wasn't, he wasn't ready. Interesting. Just that feeling. And then, Missing a flight, not being prepared, not being on time. And I, I missed a flight. It was on a Wayman Tisdale gig. And they had booked this flight around. I was actually working a day job during the same time, working at Dr. Pepper. But they had arranged this flight around my, my schedule. And I told them to put it at a certain time. And I would make sure I would be there. And I didn't have my day organized enough that day. And tried to thread the needle, and this was post nine one one. So that whole getting to the gate late and trying to plead your case, them days were over. Yeah, and I got there, dude shut the door. It was basically like I'm I'm not letting you on this flight. We'll have to put you on the next one that doesn't leave for another hour. So they literally had to call this cat. The gig was in Vegas, and a drummer that had worked with him prior to me lived in L.A. Thankfully, that guy was home. They called him, and he hopped a flight and flew to Vegas and was able to do that first show. But I missed it. But it was just gut-wrenching because that's all I could think about on the flight there. And the flight from Dallas to Las Vegas about three and a half hours. Mm. So that's a long three and a half hours. And then I get there. The bass player was traveling with me. He also basically kind of missed his flight as well. But just because he was playing bass and I don't think they could find anybody else, he was able to still get there like right before showtime, just plug in and go. For me, that wouldn't have been possible for drums. But so we actually got there. I had to sit backstage, listen to the whole show. Oh my God. Thinking to myself, like, you you literally screwed this up. Like, there's a possibility that he may not ever call you back after this, because you you could have seriously messed this day up. Wow. It's like that feeling about being on time, especially if it's flights involved, but even just driving. If you're not just giving you enough, giving yourself enough time to be there on time, get your stuff set up, be set, and then not knowing the material. And kind of the opposite side of that, being on stage with people that haven't, when you've done your homework and then other guys get on stage and they haven't done their homework, that feeling too. Because then I'm I'm literally pulling these guys along all night. Mm. Those that feeling too is just as bad as not being prepared. Yeah, I can see that. So wow. those, Man, those that, kind of and, and um, I don't imagine knowing the the work ethic you have. I don't imagine you had to learn either of those lessons more than once. Ew, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'll lose. I'll stay up all night. If I have to, if I got to start, you know, drinking caffeine and whatever I got to do, I'll write out everything, whatever I got to do to make sure that when I hit the bandstand, I'm going to be ready, period, no matter what, no excuses. If it gets to the point to where I know I don't, I can't even do that, then I'll, I'll just turn it down. Man, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, man. Yeah, yeah. Very I cool. think um, gigs wise, I can't think of any. Only thing I can think of was <laughs> my first marriage. I got married too young, and I should have taken all that time that I I spent in that first marriage, which was a disaster. <laughs> and I should have taken that time, and I probably should have went to L.A. or New York. Yeah, 
to really push <laughs> me and you wise. fist pump on that brother <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i had one of those <laughs> yeah that, that's i been hear a, you but thankfully just through the the music community hmm. i haven't completely i didn't you know lose touch with all the, the la and new york guys because of the rh gig cool. kind of kept me in the new york people's minds <laughs> um what if you you've been at you've been in this game a long time, man? Yeah. What advice if you had to go back and give your younger self advice? What advice do you wish you had gotten? Assuming you might have been open to it, as always. Man, I definitely would have wanted to take school more seriously and went ahead and stayed in college and finished. Just to not so much just to get it out of the way and just say something like, yeah, I went to school and I had a degree. Now what? No. Get a degree and have that in your back pocket. So if times get slow, which they tend to do in between tours, sure. or stuff gets funny, you have that in your back pocket. And you can walk up to a university and go, hi, I'm such and such. I would like to do private lessons or even not a university, just yourself. Yeah. I'm going to start doing lessons, blah, 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 blah. This is me. I have this in my back pocket. I'm certified. I'm doing it. I have a degree in doing it. Pay me this. Right. <laughs> this is what I'm going to accept and nothing less. Hmm. Just to have that there whenever you need it. But also just the experience of going through college, just the discipline, you mean the discipline and the integrity and your character and all that gets developed going through a system like that. Yeah. I kind of skipped over all that. And that's probably how I ended up in the marriage and I wasn't developed as a young man yet. Yeah, man, but I kind of skipped over that. That, that that those years kind of you really need those years. It, it's going to school and college and all that doesn't it just about grades. That's kind of where you kind of develop who you're actually going to be. That being said, I think you're probably being a little hard on yourself. Uh, or, <laughs> no, well, not hard. I think you probably need to be a little, for whatever that's worth, would, you probably need to be a little more forgiving because I think you've very uh, amply made up for the, the, the missing the discipline in the one aspect. I think yeah. you have more than made up for it. In the prof- in the the discipline you have in the professional aspect, yeah, yeah, more and just the simple fact that like you know you make a statement like man I can't go to a gig if I'm not a hundred and ten percent if I can't do what they need me to do not just play it but if I can't be the drummer they need me to be for that set I'm yeah. gonna decl- that that's a lot of discipline and integrity there man so I think yeah. Gotta- I think you probably need to cut yourself a little bit, of a, <laughs> a little bit of a pass for whatever that's yeah. worth. And I think. Yeah, Other than that, I, I would, I would say, I would have told myself, start working on your own stuff now. Yeah. Like it's being a side man and being always a member of something is cool. Yeah. But nothing like having your own thing, and I, I wish I would have started my own thing years ago at this point it it might have been at you know uh, a level of where I'm touring with my own band constantly and that that would be great and awesome too yeah, <laughs> yeah I know what you mean sometimes some of that especially like... starting it then when you're at the age when you can afford to you know go through that and yeah. don't have all the responsibilities of our, you know mortgage or rent and family and all family. that yeah yeah I totally yeah. get that man it's like I, t- <laughs> I told people when when I first first met Snarky, and they were touring and they were working, I was like, yeah, I, I couldn't, I wouldn't have been able to do that then because they were, those guys literally, you know, did it the hard way. Those guys were coming up and they go out, play one nighters for two three weeks, driving in a van that would barely make it from one show to the next. They were sleeping at venues and sleeping, you know, sleeping on the floor, sleeping in strangers' homes that they had just met. You know, I mean, almost a real hippie way of doing it. Yeah. 
sleeping in the van or not sleeping at all. <laughs> right. Driving 10, 13 hours, setting up everything, playing. And they did that for years before they got, you know, the ball rolling to where it was a van that wouldn't break down. And <laughs> I could be able to afford a couple of hotel rooms. And But prior to that, but looking back on it now, all those years and to what it's developed into now. Yeah. Yeah. It, it pays off. Yeah. You yeah. got guys that are with you that are going to stick with you and everybody decides we're not just going to let you just be your sacrifice. We're going to make this our sacrifice. I wish back then with the guys that I was hanging with then would have been a little bit more serious to push us all like, yo, we need to do our own thing. Like we need, we need to push that. So I would, I would have definitely told myself, start, start working on your own thing with your own music and start pushing it, get it out there. Man, thank you for Instead being so, so uh, candid on that. That's like I think a very. Oh man, I I tell all all my young young guys that I know around here. I was like, I may not be able to give you too many examples of of what to do, but I can definitely give you a ton of what not to do. Yeah. <laughs> so I, can, I can at least give you that. I can tell you if you don't do this, I can definitely tell you what happens if you don't do that. Yeah, I hear you. It's like I've, I've, I can't say that I regret a whole, whole lot, but there are some things that I do regret, but thankfully the career that I've had, I've been blessed to have. Um, it's worked out. Yeah. But there was definitely other routes that I should have taken and wouldn't have been such a, a beat up time trying to get to where I am now still would have been able to get here, but with a lot less bruising without being a knucklehead. <laughs> no, I hear you. I've made decisions like that. I've worked real hard and I didn't need to, to be honest with you. To, yeah, you know, I, yeah, I've yeah. chosen things sometimes that like, like it took me a long time to learn that pick what's least stressful exactly work it just as hard but you don't gotta pick the most stressful thing yeah i feel you on that man 100 (laughs) percent um musically if i ask you pick your top three desert island discs in no particular order and knowing this can change tomorrow just for right now this minute what would be the first three albums come to mind right now what have i been back to that i just cannot get past Um, there is a record that I've been back into recently. It's a a R&B group, actually, Mint Condition. But their drummer, Stokely Williams, is one of the best drummers I've ever heard. He's very versatile and very musical. Even though it's an R&B group, I still pull from that record. It's a record called um, From the Mint. Uh, let me make sure that this is right. I got into them because of Stokely, because he was a uh, you know, well, he still is a big influence on my playing. He's the same way. He's a drummer, but he doesn't just think like a drummer. Hmm. Plays more so because of what everything else is doing in the song. It's like everything he plays is almost like wow, that's. That's pretty much the most perfect thing you could have played right there. <laughs> it's like I just don't know of anything else that would make that fit any better. But I think it's because he sings as well. He's the lead singer of the band, and he plays other instruments as well. So I think he's always coming from that point of view. Uh, oh, record's called uh, "Definition of a Band." Mint condition, definition of a band. Yeah. What are the other two I records? always go to that record, and I can just listen to it from top to bottom and just never get never get tired of it. Um, another one, uh, I always go to Yellow Jackets. Uh, it's a record called Blue Hat. That's I haven't heard that name in a while. Actually, I yeah. saw something online with Yellow Jackets. And I was like, God, that's weird. I haven't heard. Oh that. wow, cool. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think it was this morning or yesterday. This, and I haven't. Oh wow, I haven't even heard that name of that band in you know, quite a while. And now yeah. this is, uh, that's it's the universe never. telling me I need to go check them out again or something like that. <laughs> Cats are still pushing and still playing their butt off. It's it's crazy. And that record, that record is is another one from just. From the first track to the last, it's just I never never get tired of listening to it. 
I still can pull stuff from it musically that I still use. There's there's beats on it, and I told Will Kennedy that I'm like, there's some beats that he played back then that I copped <laughs> and almost played verbatim on records that I've just cut like over the last couple of years. And what what album is that? What album is it? Yep. Which which Yellow Jackets album? Uh Blue Hats. Blue Hats, okay, thank you. Yeah. It's like the first cut on that song, uh, I think it's a track track called Cape Town. There's a African beat that he plays on that song through that whole song. It's kind of built around that beat. Um, this African rhythm that he learned from a cat from Cameroon that taught him. I used that beat on Mark's record, on Mark and Curie's record on the out gold section of, was that Spark and Echo? Yeah, it was on Spark and Echo. When it goes to the last section of Spark and Echo, the beat that I played in that section is from Cape Town, <laughs> from Blue Hat, that's from a great, record man. from 95. <laughs> that's great. That's a great, that, that Latouri record you play on is great. Spark oh, thanks, Echo. man. Yeah, that sounds wonderful. Yes, it's so crazy. He, we got to that section of the song, and when he heard that motif and that riffy, for whatever reason, my brain went to Blue Hat and Cape Town, the, the Cameroon beat that Will Kennedy played. That would work perfectly on this. Why? I have no idea. It's like a a, a rock funk tune, <laughs> and I pull out some random six eight African beat from twenty years ago, but it worked. And when I played it, Mark was like. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Good stuff, man. So, yeah. Uh, let's see. We got Blue Hats. We have Mint. What's another one that I just keep going to and putting on repeat? Um, oh, the name of the record is called Next. So Love, the name of the record is Next. Very cool. Are they out of New York? Yeah. It's that uh, trio. It's an uh, organ trio, basically. It's uh, two brothers and a guitar player. You may have already had him. If not, I would grab him, too. A uh, guitar player's name, Eric Krasno. It's yeah. uh, Neil Evans uh, on organ. His brother, Alan, plays drums. And then Eric Krasno on guitar. That name sounds really really familiar. Uh, yeah, Kras, Kras also started a band called Lettuce. I mean, that's where I know him from, I think. Him and uh, Adam Deitch and kind of like a jam band, but they're like the cream of the crop of yeah, jam bands. That's where I've heard kind of, them. Kind of ridiculous. Band. Well, cool, man. Very, very good. So live. Yeah, jackets those two and mint as of lately, yeah I've, I've had in rotation pretty heavy. What's your, uh, man, it sounds like you had a great childhood. What is your best childhood memory? Ooh. Hmm. Childhood memory. Uh, I don't know if it would be my best one, but this one always seems to stick out. I remember playing at church, and they did like they would always do yearly musicals with the choir. And I remember that year. <laughs> I guess they called themselves like financially kind of giving me a raise or like a special <laughs> offering. I think I was getting like ten dollars a service back then. <laughs> And for this musical, they gave me like an extra like $90 or $100 or something. And I remember they made a big thing about it and handed me like the special envelope with the money in it. And I just remember as a kid, I was like, I just got like 100 bucks on Sunday. Yeah. yeah. That's big stuff. I had stuff. no idea what I would do with it because I was a kid. I'm like, I don't think about money. All I think about is give me some quarters so I can go play this video game. There you go. <laughs> that was about all I could think about. But. I still remember that being in my brain for some reason. That's always been a memory that would pop up. That's, that's nice, man. As a kid, probably, well, I guess that wouldn't be considered a kid. I was like 17 by then. But, yeah, when I took that first trip overseas, I think, I guess, as a teenager or a young man, that was that was major. To Taipei. Like, yeah. Just like I still remember – all of those days and all that time, like it was, it's, those are fresh memories because I've done a lot of traveling, but I've still, I've never done anything like that since. That's major because travel, I, I have, man. Yeah. It's like, you know, traveling in and out and you're there for a couple of days and you're out. 
I essentially kind of lived in these places for a little while. So it was like I lived in Taipei for basically five months. It's like I, I lived in Jakarta, Indonesia for like two and a half months at a time. And we did that on and off for like two years, two, three years. So I, we went to Bali the first time I, we were there for a month. It's like I lived in Bali for a month. It was, it's, I've never done anything like that since. It's, it's been crazy. And it's really crazy now to go back to some of those places like Jakarta and I go and I drive through there and it's like, yeah, I remember this, this street, this still hadn't changed at oh, all. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So it's, it's a trip kind of going back. I still haven't been back to Bali yet and I've never been back to Taipei. That's very cool. But yeah, that was, that's a big memory for me. It's just, you know, those trips because yeah, it wasn't the typical just fly in and do a couple of days and come back. It's like, yeah, I, I freaking lived there basically. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey man, tell me something about yourself. People will be surprised to hear or might find a little odd. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, I know musically this always trips my friends out. Hmm. I'm a eighties fanatic. Like who? Like eighties music, just pretty much all of it. Eighties love nineties music too, but eighties music especially, that's like my thing. I you could put on anything from the eighties and I'll be happy. <laughs> But that's, if I don't know it, yeah, my, that, my wife trips out when that stuff comes on the radio and I start singing and she's like, you, you, you are a trip. <laughs> that's, like, that's your genre. That's your coming of age time. So it makes I was sense. Say, that, was, yeah. that was my childhood. So yeah. that was like Russia and all that stuff. That was, that was my childhood mm. music. I, I was split between two worlds when I grew up. I grew up in pretty much a suburban predominantly white town and white surroundings and white friends and school hmm. Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sunday is when I drove an hour from Weatherford, Texas to Arlington, Texas, like 45 minutes, 50 minutes. That's when I was at church was on Saturday and Sundays. So that's when I would see all my friends in Arlington and I would listen to the R and B music and the gospel music only on Saturday and Sunday, Monday through wow, Friday, that's interesting. back to Weatherford. So I grew up, with that going on in my life from like seven to 18 years old. <laughs> That's now you said your dad played drums. Was he a professional? That, is that what he did for a living playing dr drummer? He drummer? did for a little while. And then after that, he would just, uh, just jobs wise, just held down a regular nine to five. Right. Working. He worked at the predominantly for most of my, my childhood growing up at home. He worked at, uh, in Weatherford, it was a local newspaper there. He worked in the dark room. He was a photographer. Oh wow! As well, so he worked in their dark room at the newspaper. His long, pretty much most of my childhood. That's an interesting job. That doesn't exist anymore. That job. No, it doesn't. Yeah, he was. He had a for real like he would take me up there all the time. A for real dark room and had the three all the trays where you had to develop the negatives and run them through the liquids and hang them to dry and look at them and improve them and. Yeah, that whole process. That's very real, cool. Real dark room. I used to go up there and hang out there as a kid all the time. But we would also take <laughs> father and son time. He would also take his symbols to work sometimes and <laughs> clean the symbols there. <laughs> oh, wow. That's, that's when I got from him the importance of, hey, all the fingerprints on them symbols, get it off. Yeah. My father's symbols still look brand new to this <laughs> day, and they've got to be. 50 years old. That's good. Not a spot on them. <laughs> yeah, but that's the habits. Out. Those are great habits, man. Yeah. You know, teach you to... <laughs> he saw my symbols now. He'd be like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, no, Dad, they're not dirty. They're made that way. they made to look old. <laughs> oh, they're re they're symbols are relic now? Yeah, just the way they make them now, just kind of dry, and they do different firing techniques to make them drier, and... <clears throat> So they may look like, you know, they're a piece of junk, but I'm like, no, it's it's supposed to look like that. It's part of the sound. Oh, wow. I didn't know. <laughs> kind of the way no they're clue. doing like guitars. Like, yeah, uh, relic guitars. Uh, what's the company that's... When I first saw Earl Cooney was the first guy I saw was playing Nash guitars. Right. And he had like a telly. And their tellies, you know, that was their thing. They were making relic guitars when I, when I saw it. 
I was like, oh man, how old is that Fender? <laughs> and I looked at the headstock and it was like Nash. I was like, Nash? He's like, yeah, they make they make it look like that. Yeah. That's new. He was like, oh yeah, this was just made a couple of months ago. <laughs> yeah. It's like, remember when they, they used to make jeans and they'd stonewash them? Stonewash them. You know? Yeah, yeah. That, that was back in the same day. Thing, doing the same thing with symbols now, trying try to make them sound darker. They could kind of it makes them look like they're old. I didn't know that, man. I didn't realize. Yeah, that. you mentioned now you married again this time. Right? Yeah. How long are you with your wife? I've been married now. We got married in 2015, so three years. Hey, she's, congratulations, man! Thanks, man. Yeah, she's amazing. That's awesome. Congratulations. And, and this is this time around is what they always say about when you know you meet the right one that kind of brings the best out of you, no, yeah. no matter what. That that's now I know what they mean. It's that's like, good. Yeah, being with her man. pushes me. Any kids? So, yeah, no kids, no just kids. a puppy. Good and man. He's, he's running around here somewhere. Well, Probably good, mad. Congratulations, man. That's awesome. <laughs> Thanks, man. You, you have any hobbies or interests outside of music? I do. I love uh, hobbies. Wise, I love. Well, I don't know if this is considered. Yeah, that'd be a hobby. I love playing pool. Yeah, that's really cool. Love playing pool. I love, um, which is probably because of my father. I love scenic stuff. I love to take pictures, but I haven't gotten to the point where I'm, you know, went and bought a for real, you know, thousand dollar plus camera. But mm-hmm. I know I'm I'm headed to that eventually because I I can sit outside and just even with my phone and just take pictures of anything, nature, cars, streets, street poles, whatever. I know that side of me comes from him for the photography thing because I, I can genuinely just sit outside and just look and be happy. <laughs> so I just take the pictures of stuff. It's love creating memories that way. Um, other hobbies, I can't think of none that I really have outside of some kind of musical base hobby. <laughs> Hey, now playing pool and photography—that's good for you, man. It's a tough to find time to be to have any hobbies as a musician. Yeah, it really is. Yeah, I love games too. Video games, I, like? Yeah, like this, and that's probably why I don't own one. We still own like the first edition Wii. Like <laughs> I, I have intentionally never went and bought any other new game system, Sega or or Nintendo three hundred and sixty, or none of that stuff. I've never went and bought or Sony PlayStation because when I go over friends' houses and they have them, man, hours will disappear. Yeah. Just in some of these video games and I'll get lost. I'm like, yeah, I could, I could sit here and do this all day and it wouldn't bother me. <laughs> yeah. Too bad. You got to figure out a way you can get paid for that and you'd be all right. Exactly. I'm like, yeah, let me not ever buy one of these ever again. So I was like, nope, we'll just keep the first thing. First we, we're good. That's as far as we've gone. Well, man, I'm going to ask you two more questions. I really appreciate your time, JT. You've been awesome. Right, no problem. Um, who's had the biggest influence on your life? Oh, man. Um, as of the last, not just because I'm married to her, but literally my wife has driven me into a completely different headspace since I've met her, which that's been since 2013. That's nice, man. That he just affected me in a way where I was like, okay, it, it wasn't a case of I got to try to do better. It's like I, I have to do better in everything. Like everything about me has to change if I'm going to attempt to even one date this woman, but even be around her like, I knew I couldn't be the same dude no more. That's Just, awesome, man. It, it wasn't going to work. Good for I knew you. One, I would never be able to date her. And two, if I did, she'd dump me in a minute. <laughs> hey, man, you, she's going to listen to this. You're getting some big brownie points uh, here, brother. <laughs> awesome. This is good. And uh, prior, la- to, prior to that, uh, I can't really think of any one person, really. I didn't really have a lot of close-knit friends other than just musical people I kind of grew up with. Hmm. That was pretty much it. It was just kind of just life. 
I made a lot of wrong turns probably because I didn't have somebody involved. And my, my parents were, they weren't strict parents, but I almost wish they kind of would have been a little bit earlier on me growing up and not kind of just let me do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think a lot of things I probably wouldn't have went that direction if I had kind of had the standard strict upbringing that a lot of kids did, hmm. which I know that sometimes goes left too. Cause sometimes the more strict you are, the more crazy you end up because you yeah. just rebel no matter what. But I know sometimes it's kind of helped them stay in line. Like, look, you know, do this, do this, do this. Just, there's a reason why you, you're probably thinking we're just trying to ruin your life, but we know we're trying to make sure that when it gets to the point you're 18, your twenties and your twenties, that we've set some kind of path in front of you to go, no, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I was just kind of, I was kind of floating around everywhere else. So I was like, yeah, I'll get married. And I'm in my mid twenties, not thinking. Yeah. And didn't really have, my parents was trying to tell me in the nicest way, like, don't do it. Don't do it. But, you that, know, that's not something you can tell somebody who's there. No one's going to, yeah. you can't, that, that's not something you would have listened to. Oh no! If, if 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 and I didn't. They were yeah. they were telling me red signs everywhere, and I was like, "No, it's gonna be fine. It's gonna be yeah. fine." And yeah, fifteen years later, down that line, I was like, "Why did you just choke me and tell me?" <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not something you, that's not a message you would have heard. Yeah, no, not at all. I wouldn't. I wasn't open to it. It's it's interesting that you said that because I always tell my wife. I say, "We've got three kids. They're all older now." But I always say that. If you're going to make a mistake parenting, make the mistake of being too tough yeah, and not too soft. And when I say tough, I don't mean like beating the shit out of the kids. Yeah, yeah. I mean too tough as far as uh, expectations and, yep. and and structure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, because, you know, with grades and all that kind of stuff, my parents was real relaxed mm-hmm. with that. They were like, well, you know, you probably learned your lesson – when you failed in some courses and you couldn't play, that mm. probably taught you enough. I'm like, yeah, it didn't feel great, but I knew six weeks later I could go right back to playing. Yeah. So it didn't really. <laughs> now yeah. versus, you know, my friends, I knew you come home with a sketchy looking report card. It was a problem, mm. but I also know not that they're just better off than me. Now I just know, like you said, they, they went down the road with a lot less potholes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I hear you, man. I totally hear you on that. And last question, man. Um, yeah. What's been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of this, JT, was deliberate and intentional on your part? And how much is just a part of aging? Um, the biggest part I would have to say is... Probably the the health consciousness, I guess, of me. Good for it's, you, man. Musically, like you said, the uh, like Oz was talking about the the real hard part of being a musician. So much in the the gear gear schlepping and all that. It's it's the travel. Um, it's I can definitely say over the past ten years, a battle of bronchitis and dealing with almost being admitted with walking pneumonia holy cow because of just just burning myself burning that candle both ends and not taking care of yourself just the importance how important that really is and starting those habits of you know working out and eating right and that has become a very serious especially over the last four or five years has probably become I can't say more important than music because it's not. It's just I know if I want to continue to play at a certain level and and keep performing without always getting sick in in between tours, it's, it's getting the health thing up. It's looking at the whole vegan thing, looking at the vegetarian thing, or just eating clean, even if you are eating meats and sure. what to eat and how to eat it and when to eat it, and especially when I'm traveling, trying to find different places to eat 
and not just accept always, well, if we have to drive a little bit further or I have to wait a little bit longer to get a decent meal, let me do that instead of the quickie Jack in the Box or in an Outburger or whatever. Man, good for you. That's really a big change. So, and you, I yeah. bet you feel a hell of a lot better. I have. And then it's the, it's the opposite. When you get off of it, it's immediate. Like you start feeling like crap and it's like, oh, no, I can't go back to this. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it's been... I've been back on the because I got away from it once I got home. It's always been weird with me when I'm on the road and I'm traveling. I do much better than I do when I'm home, which is, is usually the opposite. Yeah, because it's so tough to to yeah yeah. When I'm out, I guess it's because you don't have as many opportunities to eat. So when you do eat, I usually try to make it count yeah. with a healthy meal because it might only be once or twice a day, maybe. The rest of the time is sitting in the truck and drinking snacks or whatever so you don't yeah. really get that much time but when i come home it's just it's too much time and too much access <laughs> next well, thing i know i'm like why are these jeans fitting tight again like i wouldn't have <laughs> this problem two months ago <laughs> so well, i'm glad I've you're taking care of yourself the, yeah it's like i i've been back on just learning just the importance of yeah it, it may cost me some money to join a health club but having a trainer and doing yoga and Getting into that has become an extreme investment in my life at this point. Good for you, man. Along, and I think that has to do with the aging with too. It's like touring when I was in my thirties versus touring in my forties now. Yeah, the body is definitely letting me know, like, yo, you can't, you can't tour like that anymore. If you do, you got to make a lot of other changes on the B end yeah. to get your body prepared to. You know you're going to be doing, especially like when we tour with Fork. We're not. It's not like touring with the uh, RH Factor when I'm with Snarky on tour buses. It's it's in a rental van. We're playing. If it's 13 days out, we're usually probably doing 12 shows. Oh wow! So it's a bunch of one nighters back to back with anywhere from a three hour to a six seven hour drive in between. Hmm. Setting up your own stuff. Ain't no text. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's setting up your own stuff. Unloading the van, loading it back up, try to squeeze out four or five hours of sleep in an Airbnb somewhere. And it's like, if you're doing that, then in your 40s, waking up and doing some jumping jacks or <laughs> doing some sit-ups and some push-ups and any kind of cardio you can do in a room yeah. for 10 or 20 minutes and trying to when you actually sleep, get some real deep sleep and stretching and taking your vitamins and all, all that becomes imperative. Otherwise you'll get home from a two week tour. Like I've done before here recently and I wasn't consistent with it. Got home, immediately my body crashed Wow! and caught the flu and was sick for a week and a half. And it was like a never ending. My body just shut down. And I was like, my wife even, she was like, yep, you weren't doing what you were supposed to while you're out where you I was like, I wasn't. He's like, yeah, it's obvious. It's, when you do, you come home, you're fine. When you don't, you come home, you get sick. It's always like it's A or B. Well, dude, you come to Tampa, we'll go work out. I promise you that because I work out yeah. all the time. <laughs> hey, man, let me tell people. First of all, thank you very much for everything, man. You're a pleasure man, to talk to. You're a real fucking cool guy, man. I really appreciate uh, thanks, man. everything, too, man. man. Appreciate it. Let me uh, tell people where to find you. First of all, it's Jason J.T. Thomas. It's just yeah. a phenomenal, phenomenal drummer. Um, super cool dude. He's got a bunch of projects going on. I want to tell you about him. First of all, uh, Exit 16 with Roosevelt Collier is an album they just worked on. Roosevelt's a pedal steel player, blues guy. And um, you want to talk about that? Man, yeah. That record, that record was... The epitome of it played itself. <laughs> we recorded that record like over the course of four nights, but it was four nights. The sessions wouldn't start until like midnight. Oh wow! And we would just record from like twelve to three or four in the morning. And that was mainly because Mike had so much other stuff going on during the day. It was just easy. He was like, "Let's just do this at nighttime. We'll be fine." But it was also extremely relaxed because. Roosevelt is kind of one of those players where stylistically we knew what he was kind of going to bring 
So I already had in my mind, I already kind of knew drums wise, sonically, stylistically, I kind of already knew where it was going to be going. He sent a couple of, you know, demos out of some tunes he had recorded before that he wanted to redo. And then once he played me some of the new stuff that he wanted to do, I was like, yeah, I kind of figured that's what you would be doing. So when we were playing the tunes, it was so easy. Like it's, that was probably one of the few times in the sessions where I didn't write anything down. Oh, wow. Uh, he would show us the riff. We'd run through the form. Be like, this is the solo section, then we'll end it this way. And we would just hit record. And it was just that kind of easy to the point where it wasn't a lot of thinking going on. We was just, and we all sat in the same room. This time we were like, the Snarky's got a studio where their headquarters are. Uh, it's a studio called uh, Atlantic Sound in I, Brooklyn. I was going to say they're in Brooklyn, but they're from Texas, though. How did that? How did that happen? Yeah, they all because they all came through North Texas. They and they all, all to moved to Brooklyn. Pretty much oh. everybody, but the only guys that stayed here in Texas was Mark. Well, as far as from the original band, the one of the original tenor players stayed here. Uh, works with this wedding band he works with since he's been in school. Um, who else stayed here? The original guitar player still plays with him, Chris McQueen. Chris was originally from Austin, so he stayed and went back and moved back to Austin when they got out of school. But yeah, um, most of the guys with Mike, uh, Mark stayed here in Texas. When Mike got out of school, once they finished, I think Maz, one of the the tall trumpet player, him and one of the other guys were some of the first guys to move to New York. Hmm. And after that, everybody else just kind of followed suit. They all just kind of, kind of left together. It was kind of, I guess it was always kind of their plan. They knew, I don't think they planned on moving when they did. New York's a hell of a lot more money than Denton, I would bet. Yeah. <laughs> and they, you know, they were all doing the typical New York thing. When you go there, it's, it's, it's not find a roommate, it's roommates. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so oh, no doubt. Like, you find you a two or three bed, three bedroom house or a four bedroom, and it's like five or six people in there. Yeah, yeah. And you do what you do. And a lot of those guys did that for a long time yeah. when they when they moved up there. That was how they, that was the only way they could make it. But yes, when we did that record, man, it was, yeah, that was one of the few times, I don't even think I, attempted to break out a pad or a pen it was just kind of like oh yeah we got that let's play <laughs> and every song when i listen back to it it sounds like that you could tell that we just got in there we just played it's like it was it was that relaxed as far as the tunes it wasn't just a whole lot of oh man what am i going to do on this how you want to do this what beat do you want over that it was like you hear him play that riff and it's like Oh, I know exactly what to play over there. It's like, let's just, let's go. Press and, record. And that record's out now. It's out. Roosevelt. On every every medium. It's on, as far as I know, it should be on Spotify and Apple Music and iTunes and Bandcamp and directly through the website. And I think it's on vinyl and all that as well, too. Great. Again, that's Roosevelt Collier, Exit 16. Exit 16. Um. You can find JT on Instagram at JT on drums. Yes. Um, he is going out with Fork soon. That's his own band. And they're going out yes. in June. And they will be parking their van at a venue near you. <laughs> <laughs> yep. And uh, got a couple of, got a couple of snarky dates mixed in between there. I think uh, Snarky's doing the, the, I call them the hippie festivals. <laughs> Um, in May, the Maple Leaf, hmm. uh, Maple Leaf Festival, and there's another one, and then we're actually they're coming home. They're playing in Dallas in June, June eighth. We're playing in Dallas, but then I get to go back and do. They're doing the Playboy Jazz Festival again. Oh, cool! And this year I get to do it with them. That's nice, man. And I've only I've only done that festival one time with the Irish Factor, and that festival is known because of the rotating stage. But they're also known because if you go over time, they're known for rotating you in the middle of your performance if you go over time. Really? They'll just, they'll just rotate you on off like, well, I know you're in the middle of your solo, but you're done. Wow. 
that they I remember they got us with the RH factor. Mm-hmm. There was the whole band was playing, thankfully, but yeah, we were like in this vamp and didn't realize we were overtime and next thing you know, I was like, wait a minute. I'm looking sideways they to the audience. Literally <laughs> rotate you out. They they rotated you out. Um, the other band setting up behind you and they just turn. That joker will turn as that was the funniest thing in the world to us because we were like, wow, we got rotated. That was awesome. It's like those like, old TV shows where they yeah. come out with that long hook and they just like pull you off the oh, stage. Oh, man, yeah, you're out of here. Yeah. It's like it's supposed to be a negative thing, like, you know, that's supposed to deter you from going over. But to us, it was it was great. <laughs> like, we got rotated. Yeah. Nice. Well, I told him, I was like, okay, just make sure you tell me when 45 minutes is up. So we won't get rotated. But and, I'm, I'm excited to go back to that festival. That's a fun festival. And Fork, which is your project, uh, Funk Grooves, it's uh, at Fork Music. That's F O R Q music.com. Yes. And go check out JT and support him and the guys when they come to your town. Q, I have no idea why, but yeah, Fork with a Q. Fork with a Q. <laughs> I like that. And, uh, well, 4Q, you know, that's what they used to It's like a thing from when you were kids. You remember that? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, we, we get that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And JT is also starting Skype lessons. So if you are a drummer or you know a drummer and you want to work with a guy who's very empathetic and who's a real badass on the drums, um, I would encourage hit you to up. hit him up and hit him up through his uh, d- direct message him through his Instagram account. And again, that's JT yes. on drums. And by the time this drops, he'll have those going. So awesome. uh, before the line gets long hit him up man i can't yeah. thank you enough for your time man you're very very uh candid and it was real interesting talking to you man ah uh, thanks man my I, pleasure it was fun I, I appreciate it likewise everybody thank you for listening i hope you enjoyed this interview as much as i did thanks again to jason jt thomas for spending time with us please check him out uh phenomenal drummer just really uh, i mean just watch listen and watch please anyway i appreciate <laughs> it uh go to everyone loves guitar.com sign up to get on our newsletter list get notified of future episodes along with some early product announcements and remember happiness is a choice so choose wisely be nice go play your guitar and have some fun until next time yep. peace and love everybody i'm out We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music. 